Yeah. Did Al Lewis jump in it. and like punch him? Well, no, I'm, talk, I'm talking about at the, in the studio, not in the house. Oh, was Al, Al Lewis, Lewis the, uh, was he yeah. was he a Ramones fan? <laughs> I don't know. He never, I never talked to him. Of course he was, is the answer. Space Absolutely, now. dude. Grandpa yeah. Munster. Why not? <laughs> that was good. How many uh, shows did you play on stage, Matt? More than Clem. <laughs> <laughs> and was Phil Spector just batshit crazy? or? Yes. That's one word for it. Yeah. <laughs> the rule was never drink apple juice in a remote stress. Or pitch it beer. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. You know, not everything's learned out of a book. So I, I'm right, happy. Right. I'm happy. Well, I, I, I have to, that's my sentiments exactly about what I did. Mm -hmm. That it was a good way to grow up. I was, um, I kind of, you know, I was, a, um, uh, can I curse? Yeah, you can you can do whatever you. I, I was I was what some would call a fuck up. You know, I dropped out of school and was just walking, working um, stupid supermarket job type jobs yeah. in, in the neighborhood in Forest Hills. And just by a chance of fate, um, I ended up working for the Ramones and that saved me, so to speak. You know what I mean? Here's Monty. And hey, Monty, how are you? Hey, you guys started early here, huh? Well, we're just chatting, yeah, a little bit of, a little bit of. Hey, Matt. Matt. Hey, Monty. Hey, Matt. Hey, hey Monty. Hey, hey, good to see you in person, man. Anyway, we can get started and we can go through whatever. So. Well, I, I had this. I didn't know anything, and when I made, when I called Tommy, and told him, "Oh, I heard you're looking for somebody." He asked me if I knew anything about that, and I lied and said, "Yeah," but I really didn't know anything about backline or any of that stuff and he but, grew up so you grew up next to him right he was your neighbor right yeah so why did he call you <laughs> no no i called him oh all right why'd you call him because you were like you wanted to tour with the band no 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 i um i had seen him maybe six months before i met him on the subway and he told me he was in this band the ramones and you know i just kind of fluffed it off and i think we lit we listened to them we got the record or something and i i was a led zeppelin you know old school rock guy okay so i was i was not impressed i went to max <laughs> i saw them at max's and um i was not impressed i was you know the way a lot of people felt when they first saw the remote what the hell is this you well know? according to monty i heard you in another interview money and you said the same thing in the beginning you well, weren't you weren't well, all that impressed I, well I, I saw them from the very 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 beginning and they were a three-piece group yeah, and they, uh, you know, I mean, they were raw as hell, you know, raw, 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 and you know, they were just starting out. They, you know, hardly played their instruments, and uh, you know, I was coming I, at that time. I had two albums out on Reprise Warner Brothers. I was coming from a group that was a recording artist group. Yeah, and you were touring with cool bands. And you were doing yeah. good. So, cool. and then I saw a lot of groups in the performance studios too. You know, Blondie. And the, I uh, I used to I I used to look at Monty when he would come out come to the stage when they were on and i would look at him and go he doesn't like this you know <laughs> he's not a it got better <laughs> got better so why did you stick with it monty why did you stick with the ramones <laughs> yeah. um, initially uh i was working with them in performance studios uh tom and i built the place performance studios on 20th street both broadway and park it's re it was a rehearsal uh had some recording uh, facilities there and we got time there to do our own projects. Uh, I had my own bands at the time. And uh, he came in with the, the Ramones just to produce them and manage them. And they were a three-piece group. So they started doing showcases there. And so I was running the PA for them at the time in the, in the performance studios. And then they started getting jobs, you know, CBGB said, you know, come on out and 
work with us do the PA for uh, us at CBGB's. I said, fine. And then the studio, unfortunately, because the neighbors had to shut down. <clears throat> the noise in the neighborhood and all that, we, they shut the place down. And all of a sudden, Ramon started getting jobs. Okay. And, you know. So uh, you're just going with the flow. So I went with the flow. And it was great because, I mean, it, it got bigger and bigger. That the, the bigger they got, the more people I could hire. I was doing everything in the beginning, you know. Yeah. With uh, Joey's brother and myself and and then the, the bigger they got, uh, you know, doing the PA, and then they decided to hire a regular PA guy and a monitor guy, and more, more roadies and stuff like that. So, and then and they started shit became a mess. Know, touring all over the, they got to see, you know, go to places I'd never been to before. Yeah. Especially around the world. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. You know, Japan, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So, was what great. was it like when you guys were doing? So, you're doing shows out of the country, out of the US. And you'll do, you'll play for a lot of people, and then you guys would come back to the U.S. and you play for like six hundred people. So were you kind of like, what, were you caring at the time, or was it was it a, a thing of like, what the hell's wrong with us in America? Like, come on, guys, well, this is great. Yeah, that was a problem. I mean, it bothered them. You know, they could see how, how big they could get overseas first. You know, and then they we had to come back and play these small dumpy clubs all over the United States. I think that was the fault of the uh, radio here in the United States. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't get on the radio. You know? Yeah, they couldn't. Get, I, uh, I, I was I got disappointed by the you know the the clubs, and I think that's one of the reasons I finally left. I felt yeah. like we weren't. It wasn't going where we felt it should go. You know, we were just doing the same in the states. The same. When you clubs. say we, you're talking about the whole band and you and everybody. I me personally, and okay. I felt yes, the band was not going. You know, I told you that I worked for you too for a bit. Right. And when I worked for them, we did the same clubs that I did with the Ramones. And then the next thing you know, they're you too. You know, they're like the sure. biggest band in the world. And that's where I wanted to be. You know what I mean? I wanted the Ramones to get like that. It just never happened. Did you tour with them when they were bigger? The, big, the bigger uh, venues? Matt? No, no. I, I toured with them. When we were doing Toad's Place and oh, just Malibu. The club stuff. Wow. We were Same doing the club places stuff. the Ramones. The Ramones were. Yeah, then the next thing they did was Sunday Bloody Sunday and they blew up. And remember when we opened for them in Milton Keynes? Yeah, how come you didn't stick with them? Because they went back to Ireland and it became a whole thing of me being a United States ah. citizen and bringing me over there. How'd and that's when I wound up here. Back. Huh? How'd you get involved with them here? Frank Gallagher. Oh. Frank Gallagher, he knew them. Their, their people. I was working for Chubby Checker. He called me and said, oh, this band, you too, they need a guitar tech. And um, I jumped on it and left Chubby Checker and went with them. And he said, you know that song, I Will Follow? And I said, nah, I don't, I don't know who they are. <laughs> and um, they were young kids then. They were 18, 19 years old. Wow. Um, so, with Chubby, so could... Chubby Checker like helped you get a gig and then you ditched him. <laughs> No, well, Frank called me when I was, I, there was a break with the Chubby. You know, it's Chubby. funny, I was just reading up on him, but he's still alive. And with a name like uh, Chubby Checker, he's the one who's outliving all of the other rock stars, you know? Yeah, Chubby, that was, um, that was a strange tour. I went from the Ramones to Chubby Checker. So and, I wanted uh, to ask you this. When you went back to the Ramones, were the guys in the band kind of like, tell us about Chubby Checker? I mean, were they no, no, didn't no. care? No, they didn't care. Uh, they, they were like, tell us about you two. <laughs> no, they didn't even ask about that. You know, <laughs> this you two thing, because I, I saw you had told me you worked for you two. And then the song that uh, Joey listened to before he passed away was a right. two song. And then um, I was they listening. They wrote a song. They wrote a song, The Miracle of Joey Ramon. So then they did the song, right? And, and then I, I was listening to an interview with Joey, who, by the way, was really fun to watch an interview. I didn't realize he was, he was very funny. He was a cheeky asshole. It was great. I was laughing my ass off. He was very good. Yes, but he, um, he, they asked him about U2. I'm like, why does U2 keep popping up all over the place? Is it just completely random? Is there any kind of well, glue? <laughs> What we did, we played that Milton Keynes Festival in um, England, and you two were the headliner. REM were on the bill, we were on the bill. I can't remember who else, but it was that kind of band, alternative, so to speak, bands. Yeah. And we were back backstage, and I ran into Bono and Larry Mullen, the drummer. Yeah. And they said, please, please introduce us to Joey. 
Oh, and they were already huge. They were already Sunday Bloody Sunday huge. I mean, they sold out that whole place, you know. And I took them back into the dressing room, and Bono looked up at Joey like Joey was God, you know. And well, yeah, they grew up listening to the Ramones. So Ramones yeah. inspired a lot of people. Uh, yeah, when they were young kids, that's the that's a beautiful part about the legacy of the Ramones. Is they played all over these small clubs, all over the world, all over the United States, and all these kids come come to see the band. Yeah. And they realized that the Ramones can do it. It wasn't like, you don't have to be a great musician, like Eric Clapton on a guitar or something, or, you know, play drum solos and stuff like that. Just simple, easy music that the Ramones are doing that inspired all these kids to form bands and they give them credit down the line. Do you think you're one of those you kids too. that they inspired? Because, I mean, you are like, the Ramones legacy is very important to you. What are you talking about, kids? Monty, Monty. Hey, I mean, I'm the same age as the Ramones. So. Yeah, but I mean, in the beginning, you were like, eh. But you stuck well, with it for 22 they, years. I mean, you could have got a different gig. They got better. Yeah. They got better. The job got very interesting, what I was doing, you know? I spoke my mind. Monty, Monty's like myself to an extent. Monty's a keeper. He's going to stay. You know, that's a good attribute to have. And that's why they loved him. Yeah. Well, despite yeah. all the crappy talk, <laughs> yeah. that was, you know, that I wanted to get into a little bit. Of, I mean, tour management's kind of tough, but boy, dude, you must have had it really hard. You've got you've got two guys in the band that both have obsessive compulsive disorder who won't speak to each other for 15 years. I know you had tour buses, but a lot of times you're in vans. I've worked for some bands where they don't always get along. But I mean, this is like a, a lot, a lot of work for a tour manager. My Mont Monty took a lot of shit from crew and band. That's the thing, you know. People say you work for a band. There's also a crazy crew behind the band yeah. to deal with. So it's doubly amount of nutty people you got to deal with over the years. You know, crazy people like this guy. Kind of, yeah. No, but I, I no, he was good. He was good. He was good. Except for there were some thing. people though that <laughs> this, you know, abuse. Yeah, people. well, you know, like we went through a bunch of different people, and you get the good, the bad, and the ugly uh throughout the history but so you're uh, driving you're driving the van a lot of the time right monty almost all the time uh, yeah early years i drove a lot later later years i had the uh, assistant with me that drove and did a lot of driving and then we had some tour buses in europe we always had uh coaches not, right. not sleepers but always coaches so somebody, somebody else is always driving in europe overseas in, you know japan australia it's just the united states that you know so are you two vans? You got like a crew van and you have a band van, or is everybody in the same van and the shits in the U-Haul? Or no, we had different uh, setups over the years. Go ahead, Matt. You can explain some of that. No, no, no. Well, uh, up until my time, I drove a truck. Oh no, way. we did have the semi. We had Jeff Trucky. Yeah, so yeah. So we did. Have, well, it was a, we it, was a, a big, it was a big. I don't know. It's a semi, just a big truck, right? Was it big yeah, he had a um, a big dub box truck. He had a, a, a right. Be Beacon's moving truck yeah, that, he yeah. had, that he had purchased to do moving. And then he got sick of moving and he just whited out the Beacons and he used that for Ramon's equipment. Well, over the years, it changed, you know, there's different setups. I think early on, we had a van and a station wagon, a van pulling a U-Haul and a station wagon driving, driving the van. And the van was in the van for a while. It's in the U-Haul. And then the crew went to a truck and the van was in the van. And uh, then we had PA company in a separate truck. We had one time we had three trucks. We had sound truck, band truck, and t-shirt truck. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah. merch. Yeah. Yeah. So it was all, you know, you're talking about 20 years. There's so many different. Uh, yeah, different lineups. Different types of uh, vehicle. So when yeah. these two guys aren't talking to each other, would they just sit on the different side of the. It, of the here's the thing. Yeah. It wasn't as bad as people say. That was, was a big question. Just later on, I mean, in the early years, they were friends. They talked, they talked, they had to talk, they had to get the sets together, they had to see what, you know, record in the studios, they had to set the, you know, pick songs for the sets. Just later on with the Linda thing, they stopped socializing and talking in the van a lot. You know, like we were in the van or on a bus, or whatever, they just wouldn't hang out with each other or talk to each other there, basically. They, you know, listen to their own music or whatever. But they, they had conversations. Yeah, it wasn't. So it wasn't just completely ignoring each other. Wasn't completely ignoring each other. They just because it's a awkward. Lot of, it, well, you know, 
sometimes you work with somebody and you don't talk to them, uh, socialize, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, but, they have different buses, like some of the bands I work for, they've had right, different right. buses and so whatever, you know, sound check, they go up, they do the sound check, they bail. I don't know how they do interviews and stuff, but I mean, in the meantime, they just, you know, they don't really like each other. So. Yeah, I mean, they, they, later years, they didn't socialize, they didn't particularly like each other socially, but they, they realized that the music they were doing was better, was more important than just fighting each other and breaking up. You know, when you, when you go on stage and there's 30,000 people like admiring you and this incredible feedback, I, I was a musician myself, so I knew sure. what that felt like. You got a freaking high, you know, it's a high when, when you're playing good and the, and the crowd's like feeding back to you. And you know, uh, were there moments then where so they're, uh, you know, they're not getting along, but then you look at, you, you can see one look at the other and smile like, oh, that was good. I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't watch them that closely when they were on stage. Basically, <laughs> I put them on stage and go to the promoter and get paid and, you know, work things out, basically, you know, so. So uh, how often in those early days was it hard to get paid? Did you have a lot of issues with giving? No, no, no. Luckily, over the years, we had good booking agents. So oh, they, man. when I went to the club, I said, you, you know, don't fuck around. You know, you're not going to get other people in your club or venue if you don't uh, do what you, the contract says that you have to do. But uh, usually, I mean, in the year, you know, they built up enough audience that we didn't have that problem. There was enough people coming sure. to see them selling out and later on in the year. So I didn't really have much problem that way. Was um, the band like fist fights and you were like breaking up the fist fights in the band and stuff? The band? This yeah, like time? over 20 years, was there no, anything? No, 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 no. As I said, okay. they wouldn't go that far because they realized what they had together musically, they didn't want to break up because they really had something special going musically. That's cool. They, were, they weren't, they, they uh, weren't physical anyway. What? They weren't physical like that. No, no, no. I mean, Dee Dee was, was crazy at times. He'd sometimes pull out his knife and flare it around and get upset at things, you know what I mean? <laughs> Ma, do you remember? Do you remember in SIR when um, in LA when yeah. Dee stole Mark's money? Yeah, yeah, you talked about that. Go ahead, go ahead, say it. That um, Mark was wearing um, like girls' gym shorts, so he had, didn't have anywhere to put his money. So he had it in his sneaker, and when he was playing drums, he couldn't have it in his sneaker, so he put it on the bass amp. And all of a sudden, towards the end of the rehearsal, the money was gone. And um, he started freaking out. And John made everyone come in. Johnny made everyone come into the room and empty their pockets. Oh, and, no. there it was. <laughs> and there it was in Didi's pockets. <laughs> but, yeah, but Didi, Didi was a character. Didi was. One word for him there. Didi had multiple personalities. After the Ramones, Monty, did you go work for a different band? Yeah, I, I did a little work with Degeneration and Jesse Mallon. That was fun. But the good part about that is that we're all in a van and they're all joking around and having a good time. It's such a different atmosphere with them, you know? Yeah. And I did a little work with Ronnie Spector. Oh, so Phil Spector. She got very <laughs> friendly with Joey there for a while. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so Phil Spector... Uh, were you in the studio? Were you guys in the studio when they were recording that album? Yes. Yeah, we were there. And was Phil Spector just batshit crazy? Or... Yes. That's one word for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I read, you know, he made him play like the same guitar chord for hours and everywhere. The band is like, why do we have this fucking guy? Or were they trying their best or a bit of both? For Rock and Roll High School, he did that. Yeah, that's the opening chord for Rock and Roll High School. We made John play it a million times. Uh, and John got pretty fed up with him, you know? He, he really, left. Yeah, he left. And then, yeah, he left. They came back. But, but, and actually, we had to uh, tell Phil to, to we to, he had a meeting at the uh, Tropicana at the, uh, where I think Seymour came in and people from the record company came in and said, Phil, you got to take, calm down a little because, you know, because he would get really crazy in the studio sometimes, like yelling, screaming. And he had guns on him. I was going to say know. to bring his guns. <laughs> he had guns on him. Did you see any guns, uh, Matt? No. No. I saw, I saw, he had the guns on. He got, a, he got an ankle holster. He cut up once and put the flip foot, put on the console once. He never pointed it at anybody, you know. I, th I think that, that that was the thing with the Phil Spector record. I think every record you thought that was going to be the record that was going to be the hit, didn't you, Monty? Well, that's why they kept on switching producers. They just want, they wanted to get a hit on the radio in the States. Yeah. So they, they figured, I mean, Tommy and Ed Stacey, and they did great, terrific jobs. But then they figured, let's get uh, some other producers 
So they went to create like Graham Goulman from 10 CC, John Bobois, Phil Spector. Richard, uh, Richie, whatever, Laguna, the Joan uh, Jett person. Yeah, look, Kenny Laguna and uh, uh, Glenn Kalatnik, I think that's no, no, so I can't remember his name, but he, he wrote us the song uh, Crimson and Clover. Who wrote that song? Yeah, R Richie Cordell. Richie Cordell. They just, they wanted a hit. They wanted to get on radio here in the States. Yeah. So that, that's where they kept on trying, trying. Phil Spector, I mean, before, you know, 1977, when we were in L.A. at the Whiskey. Were you there uh, when we played the Whiskey? No. The he came, Phil Spector came backstage. There's a picture of my book uh, of him there. He's like, he, he, was, he had like a, a cape on and, uh, let's see if I find it. And, uh, you know, beard and, and a... Um, he had he wore a cape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he dressed up crazy, let me tell you. Uh, and here, here's a six. The picture of him. Oh, uh, there you go. There. He looked like the devil. This is 1977. We're playing the whiskey. Yeah. See, he's got the cape on there. Got the glasses. He looks like a vampire. He looks like yeah. he's out of. Uh, <laughs> so he, he, the, uh, 77. He, vampire movie. In 77, he was interested in doing stuff with the band. It took him a while. And finally, Seymour got him to do the album, you know, because, you know, and then we got into, you know, we, he was a, you know, the hero of the band, they, they loved the stuff, but get, going into the studio with him was pretty crazy, right, Matt? Well, first, first we had to go to L.A. to do it, which they hated. And remember staying at the Trop? Isn't that when Dee got arrested that night? For I think he the Yeah, he owed Dee. And, uh, um. What did he get? He got arrested because he was Dee? Well, he owed Dee, we were at the Tropicana, and a, a lot of New York fans were there. Dead Boys, the Sick Fox were there, and it was just a big party atmosphere. And actually, me and Monty went out to go to get tacos. And as we pulled up to the Trop, they were dragging Didi out unconscious in handcuffs and putting him in the back of an L.A. police car. Wow. And he OD'd in the, uh, in the cop station? Yeah, they took him to the hospital. Yeah. And came oh, man, what a nightmare. Uh, but, you know... Dealing with Phil in the, in the studio was difficult. Uh, he was very, you know, he had his ways. He wanted to do things. And uh, the band didn't like it. You know, band liked to work fast, fast, fast. Yeah. Everything's fast, you know. But yeah. Spectre was like slow, slow. Do things over and over again. Driving Johnny crazy. Yeah, they said, so, what was it, a couple weeks or something he was there? And they had a budget of 200 grand or something, which was just so much more yeah. illustrious than what they had had before. And then we'd go up to his house, and to get in and out of his house, you had to lock, unlock the doors either way, getting in or out. So he kept us up there for a while. Do you ever, do you ever go to the, oh, you, no, no. It was crazy. He locked us in his house for a couple of times and we played like horror movies. We had to watch like four times the same movie. And stuff like that. <laughs> uh, what does that got to do with the album? I don't know. He just invited us up to the house for, you know, to you hang out with him. Watching you know? movies? <laughs> yeah, horror movies. One time we went there and uh, Grandpa Munster was sitting on the couch there. Oh, was, hell yeah. Yeah, Al Lewis, whatever. He was a friend of uh, Phil's and stuff like that. But, uh, but <laughs> we got to know the crazy side of it. And then, you know, one time we were, we, we were, gonna, we were leaving the studio and Phil said, don't leave. You know, don't. So he comes up to me and says, give me the keys, Monty. Give me the keys right now. Give me the keys to the van. I said, no, Phil, no. We're leaving now. So we, we left. You know, we got out. Of oh, he studio. wanted to keep him so you wouldn't Yeah, leave. he wanted to stay. He wants to stay. Did Al Lewis jump in it. and like punch him? Well, no, I'm, Lewis, talking, I'm talking about at the, in the studio, not in the house. Oh. Was Al, Al Lewis, Lewis a, uh, was he, he was he a Ramones fan? <laughs> I don't know. He never, I never talked to him. Of course he was, is the Space answer. Now. Absolutely, <laughs> dude. Grandpa yeah. Munster. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> that was good. I love the Munsters. I don't know. All right. So, Matt. So you're you're finishing up in uh, 1988, right? And and you decide yes. uh, you decide you've you've uh, you've for better words here you're, you're turning the page of your book. I'm gonna try something else in life here. I've I've been a roadie for a minute. So what did you go do? What did what did you want to do? And why? What was the catalyst of you saying I, I want to do something different? Because you're still a young guy in 1988. Not that you're an old man right now. So I just I just thought about that. It's something bad, but um, well, I, I first I started having children. So ah. I had two kids already. And um, the Ramones, the, the, let's say the pay wasn't great. Yeah. And there was no, nothing was on the books. It was all ca cash. And so there were no benefits. No, so my accountant would say to me, what are you doing, man? You have kids now. You know, you're trying to be a responsible adult. And 
you get injured, what's going to happen to you? Who's going to take care of your family? You have no nothing. You know what I mean? No coverage or anything. Yeah. So um, I just finally made the decision. I told them on actually on the plane coming back from Europe. I told John, Johnny, and Johnny said, oh, 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 he didn't want me to leave for uh, because he was comfortable with me. I'd been there a long time. You know, I, I could think, you, you know, you, you do that for a no, long enough time. You could think the way he thinks. I would hit his on and off button. I could do a lot of different things for him. Yeah, and he actually said, played a guitar behind the stage, one, behind the amps for what song, right? That was yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Johnny, John, Johnny, for all the bad things that are said about him, he's a very loyal person. And, you know, if you're going to stay with them and be loyal, he's going to be loyal to you. But money was the line with him. And he said, talk to Monty and we'll try to give you what you want. And I came up with some figure and Monty went to him. And of course, it was no. And I said, well, then I'm leaving. And um, we were at Club A in New Jersey. And during the encore, John looked at me and said, are you going to stay? Are you going to stay? And I said, no, I'm not staying. I'm out of here. But you thought and, they'd pay you? Yeah, I, I don't know. Even if I got the money, if I really would have been happy. You know, mm -hmm. I was I was more of the feeling like I'd been there, done that already. You know, that the novelty had kind of grown, worn off, you know. Um, and I did have a family. And I love my kids. And I love my, you know. Yeah. Um, what would you do? What your career did you do? Uh, that's kind of a, a gray area to go into. <laughs> well, because it's, you know, the reason I ask is this. It's like, so I know for you finish, your resume is like, I've been working for the Ramones and I've been doing backline. What does backline mean? I fucking plug in the guitar or whatever. So you're explaining what you do for a living. And it's kind of a weird, I remember for me, you know, I'd worked for Poison. I went to go a job interview. They're like, wow, Brett Michaels, that's fucking cool. They're like, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's a good guy. But they're not going to hire me. <laughs> they just wanted right, to hear right. a story. And I was like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, you know, you, you had a lot of life left. Actually, what I did after, after, what I did after is actually could be another book altogether. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, Leisure activities, that's, it was not legal. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> and, and you know what? Ironically, it's legal now in most places. I'm almost yeah, everywhere true. now. The world has changed and nobody cares right. anymore. It's all changed. And it, and it was very Ramones related too. It was kind of was like the same people, but I just went into that for better or for worse for the money. Because it was good for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> the money was good for me. The money was good. For the but kids. I did. I, I I have to tell you, I did go through withdrawals. You know, leaving yeah. the band. And at times, I had regrets. And I would talk to Arturo, and he would say, "Matt, Matt, you come back. You'd be here for one week, and you'd hate it again. You know, you'd be back in the same clubs, doing the same thing." And um, uh, I, you know, I stuck with my decision. It's a rough job. Uh, I, luckily, I worked my way up. You know, in the beginning, I was doing everything, shut the equipment, setting up the stuff. The bigger they got, the more people I can hire. So I was traveling around later with the band, you know, yeah. which is much better. You know, heck yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't have to shut up equipment or set up stuff or worry about uh, tuning things or whatever else. I was. I had other responsibilities, which is a huge amount of responsibilities. It was, uh, you know, more suited for what I would like to do. You know. Are you, you're friendly with Linda now, right, Monty? Oh, yeah, I'm friendly with Linda and Nikki, both of them. I try to keep on the good side of both of them. Yeah. So was it difficult for her, you think, because she was in the middle of this? You know, I, I, I think it's in, you said it's inflated, but, you know, this love triangle and the political beliefs of blah, blah, blah. She's the one in the middle of it all. Do you think it was hard on her? In a way, basically, you know, because she really couldn't come to the show's out front, would she come and she'd be back? He would put her back on the soundboard so Joey wouldn't see her and keep her out of sight. You know what I mean? So it was, it was difficult. Actually, you know? that, that whole thing went down when I left and then I came back. When I came back, the crew told me what was going on with, with the Johnny Linda thing. And they said, You'll see, you'll see. She's, um, she stays in the hotel, but on a different floor, right, Auntie? Yeah. They kept her separate away, away from so Joey wouldn't see see her at all you know wow which was hard on you know seeing her was hard on joey you know so he kept that away and he realized that so how long was she sorry it would be bad you know if they you know had confrontations you know 
And then the political fighting would start after the argument about other stuff or what do you mean? I saw, I read too, that there were a lot of political uh, differences, I guess you could say. So I mean, politics, I mean, politics about the Democrats. Oh yeah. A left wing hippie is what I read online. It was a left wing hippie versus the, uh, the right wing who wasn't well, a hippie you know, they would fight all the time. No, but... They wouldn't fight all the time. I mean, the, Joey wrote that song, Bonzo Goes to Bitburg about Reagan. And uh, Johnny was a huge Reagan fan, but he still did the song. He recorded it. You know? Yeah. Joey wrote it. They never talked politics. They realized they didn't want to fight, you know? And so then, a lot of the fighting well, stuff, you think it's just embellished online to keep a lot of this more in the news? A lot of over, over blow. But so that's a shame about, because I don't know if you necessarily need all that crap because the music was good. You they know? talk about politics. The later years, one of John's better friends was Eddie Vedder. Well, now, uh, you want to talk about opposite politics? Yeah, right. They never talk yeah. politics. They talk baseball, you know? So they, they, you kept it out. The Ramones didn't talk politics. They talked music, basically. Are you involved at all with the Hollywood Forever stuff that they do every year? I'm not involved, but I go to it. Have you spoken at it and whatnot then? Or? Yeah, I've done a few things there. That's cool. Is Linda involved? or? So yeah, it's, whole, it's her thing. It's basically, her thing. she has the uh, Hollywood Forever like tribute there, and, and, and uh, Mickey has his Joey Ramone bashes here in, 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 in New York. Uh. Okay, so a question I like to ask everybody, um, I was at my friend's house, I was putting together a podcast here, and my friend's daughters are uh, in fifth grade, and so they said, you should ask every guest when they first felt famous, and so I ask each of you, when did you first feel famous, and if fame is not an yes. avenue that you want to pursue, when did you first feel good about what you were doing? When is there a moment in your careers that makes you smile, that, that was just something worth telling? um possibly these little girls unless it's a bad story and then maybe not but uh just 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 a moment in time that you're proud of yeah. i'm just you, you know this all came about that how how now they're legends and i guess because of the moniker little matt and big matt and being in all the books um a lot of people give me a lot of respect for being there in the early years for the albums that mattered, right? For even to the rich years. I mean, like Monty, I was with all four drummers, right, Monty? Yes. Cle Tommy, Marky, Clem, Richie, and back to Marky. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the work I did. And people have said that to me, that you were there when it mattered. You did the hard work. I drove the van with the U-Haul. Um, and I see how much the Ramones mean to people. And I, I'm proud. I'm happy that, you know, I have no regrets. I have no regrets that I left. And I definitely have any regrets that I did it in the first place. Well, so, you know, Best Cruise, we had two Matts. We had Big Matt and Little Matt. Okay. That's what we call because they both named Matt. So that was one of the best crews we had together. And, uh, you know, I mean, I wrote my book. No small undertaking, I may add. On the road with the Ramones. It's like Jack Kerouac. It just has Ramones in it. The bonus edition just came out. Get the one with the red Ramones writing on it there. Amazon.com. Cool. So I, I, I was lucky enough to get all things that was inside of me out, you know, which was great. It was a cathartic experience writing a book and getting things out and having people say things and pictures and passes and um, all sorts of. I was lucky enough that in the book, they let me put in like over 300. 50 pictures and images and photos and passes. So, you know, usually books have like text, 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 some pictures in the middle, text, text, text. My book's like full of pictures and images and stuff like that. It's good for the punk rock crowd because you don't know how, you don't have to read it. You just look at the pictures, you know, that's good for the punk rock audience, basically. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Mar Marty, has, Marty has the best book, the best Ramones book. Out right, there, you, you'll get, you'll sure. get the check later today. <laughs> no, he does. Yeah. He does. He does. He's, he's been he's, waiting all these years. He's been waiting since 1988. No, no. He does. He does because it comes from his perspective with all four of them. It, it's the best book out there. Well, yeah, because I was lucky enough to be there from the beginning, basically, of the Ramones yeah. to the end of the Ramones. Yeah. There's nobody else around that can say that. Arturo was there. Unfortunately, he passed away. He's yeah. still around. I mean, Arturo and myself. 
from the beginning to the end. So I, right. I saw the whole sure. thing. I was there for everything. I'm happy to still be around for it, you know? There's still things are happening. Do you have any fun memories of any gigs that you guys did where you, you're walking in? And I, I know there are some, but you're walking in. Your well, book's the full hell? of fun memories. <laughs> But are there any specific venues that you remember walking into? Like, how the hell are we going to set our shit up here tonight, man? What are, this is what the hell is this place? I think the early days there were gigs like that. Yeah, you get to a club or something. It's like a flight of stairs or something. There, you say, "Oh crap!" You know, got to take yeah. all the stuff up these stairs and bring them back down the stairs. Um, What's the most amount of gigs you guys did in one day? What do you mean? Shows we played? In yeah, one. like how many shows in one day did you get? I'm sure you did two, like a bunch of times. But did you do more than two ever? No, not very rarely. I don't think we ever did two shows. Once or twice we played. We opened up for Black Snow. Uh, who did the, the Reaper song? Uh, Blue Acer Cult. In, oh, sure. Uh, in the Nassau Coliseum. And then we had a place in New York that night after we opened up for them. But they never really played two shows. Oh, I'm surprised. No, ex- the one time, though, in the early years, we were in Oregon in some small town, you know, Bremerton or something, like a, a lumberjack club or something, one of those clubs that had the chicken wire in the front. And uh, the crowd, you know, they didn't know who the Ramones were. But at that time, they were playing, like, short sets, you know? Because, yeah. you know, we played, like, 30 songs in a half an hour or something like that. Yeah. So they go on stage and played. They played. They came off stage. The promoter, the club owner came over to me and said, uh-uh. That's not good enough. You kind of have to play more. So I play the whole set over again. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so that's the closest we came to playing two shows. We'd never played two shows basically at, on a night. So was it an argument or did the guys just laugh and be like, all right, let's just do it again? Well, no, they, I told them, look, we're not going to get paid unless you go and play some more songs. They didn't have that many more songs, really. So they, they, they played the set again and nobody understood. The club, the people in the club were like, lumberjacks they did you know they didn't know what the ramones were what so they they didn't know the songs when they played them second time you know what I mean? that's hilarious yeah i so a good buddy of mine's doug carry on doug actually came on with andy Chernoff on one of these episodes and um it was a heck of a lot of it was cool andy's a really nice Andy's fella. great he's a really good goose good so doug said that he had he had wondered you know that they're trying to save money. They're, they're riding in vans. They're, they're, they're socking away money. They're socking away. He had heard that they had invested into parking lots. And so my question is, uh, did they invest in parking lots maybe? But were they, were they trying to uh, squirrel away money with the ideas of investing in other stuff to do later in life? Talk about the amounts investing yeah. in parking lots? Yeah, he had heard they invested in parking lots. That's a good one. Never heard that. Yeah, I looked online. John, I couldn't find anything. I mean, I, I think, John, Monty, didn't John hate the idea of the tour bus and would much rather be in the van? Well, the thing about they didn't have a lot of money, basically. We, you know, weren't they bringing in a lot of money on the, you know, in, in, in venues and stuff in the early years? And so we tried the tour buses. The problem with the tour buses, you had to sleep on the tour buses. Yeah. They were very expensive. You had to pay a driver. They liked to stay in hotels. We had a tour bus, the early tour bus, we did had a tour bus and then we stayed in a hotel, you know, so it got really out of hand. So they, what they did in the estates basically was they do like sections, like, like the West coast. Somebody would drive the van out there. We'd fly out there. Then we'd go up and down the coast for a couple of weeks and come back in a van. And then van was more economical because, and they like to stay in hotels. So did I, I didn't like sleeping on a bus either. You know what I mean? So I, I try to save a lot of money for them over the years doing different things like that. You know, I booked all the hotels basically and uh, kept an eye on the finances in the beginning. Did Do you all know my... they were investing in other stuff while they well, were John was a John was an investor. He, he was very heavily into the financial investing. So he, mm-hmm. he squirreled, you know, every, any money he made, he would invest. And of course, the money they were making basically was from merchandise. Sure. T-shirts, T-shirts. And T-shirts. T-shirts. And other things, programs and stuff, but basically t-shirts and programs, a lot of money they were making from that. That's kept them on the road. They're basically a touring band because of, they couldn't sell a lot of records, you know? Right, right. And yeah. boy, that merchandising was amazing. I wish I got a piece of that. Phew. Yeah, crazy. Still crazy. Still, still out of the way, you know, not, unbelievable. Did you guys do sound checks? Yeah. No. Yeah, well, see, a lot of times we did. Some, in the early years, we'd do sound checks. 
Let's say on and off. We did sound checks. We, we uh, when I was there, we sound checked for them. Oh, okay. I mean, later on, maybe the festival, you know, other places I remember doing sound checks and stuff like that. We went to, you know, South America and uh, Europe and stuff like that. When we could, we do sound checks. Mm. We never mm. watched the opening bands, I'll tell you that. They did or did not? They did, basically. Because they had more time to, you know, why go spend it at a club watching another band, basically. Unless yeah. it was a big festival or something, which they come a little earlier and watched a, a big group or something like that. Basically, they didn't, you know, clubs and bigger venues. Do you remember any times yeah. in the bus where they were excited about playing with anybody in particular? And you, and we, did, we played with you two when they, when they had a big, uh, big concert, you know, stadium tour. That was, they were excited about that. Uh, basically no because they were headlining mostly you know yeah and so matt you played on stage a little bit yeah not on stage behind stage behind stage hidden behind the amps but it's the secret's out everyone knows at yeah. this point There's so what song. songs were you playing on uh, we want the airwaves and time has come today that's great because there was certain guitar parts in there johnny couldn't play it on live and then they decided to do it this way which is very interesting yeah, it is neat. So you'd have your own little area? You'd be taped off I, back I, there? I just had a Marshall head, one cabinet facing out. And um, for two seconds in it, in both of those songs, I played a little lead part. And a lot of the kids up front would wonder because they'd be watching Johnny's hands and he's not playing lead. And John John wasn't very secretive about it. You know, he just, he, he just went with it. That's fun yeah, though. That's strange. part of that's cool little legacy part for you. I mean, it's really neat. He's the fifth remote. Yeah, you're the fifth no. <laughs> Monty. no. No, people say Monty the fifth remote. No, no, no. I'm like hey, Marky's the fifth remote. Okay. And then goes from there, six, seven, eight, ninth. Maybe I'm a ninth or tenth, maybe. You know? <laughs> Did you watch that interview with Johnny Rotten where he's wasted? He's so drunk and yes, he's talking yes. shit to everybody. It's so funny. What with Mark <laughs> you're talking what, what, about? Yeah, he starts talking shit to Marky Ramones oh, yeah. there, and he starts, he's just talking shit to everybody. He's just super drunk, and uh, I don't know, I found it pretty entertaining as a viewer, you know, <laughs> sitting there, I mean, Marky's like, you're not even one of the members of the fucking group, but Marky didn't actually talk a lot of shit, he got quiet. Where, they, they, all, they almost got the fist fight there, they almost got into a fist fight there. Oh, you can see it, I loved the interview. Henry Rollins is even quiet, and Henry Rollins loves to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you know did you so with the uh <laughs> well we just had to put, talk about giant rotten when we went to europe in 77 um uh, in london uh you know we used to get uh pitchers of beer we hated it because we i never had on the rider pitchers of beer i always had bottles you know we like bottles because what happened was backstage we got these pitchers of beer and they pissed in it and then johnny rotten came back and they gave him the beer the drink so it's a true story so he knows that i think that's why he, he hates the ramones well it's i wouldn't like him either Piss but, in my uh, well he actually the you know he he didn't know the difference because english you know was like the one beer, but did they watch him <laughs> drink it like yeah they laughed they were laughing wow the rule yeah. was never drink apple juice in a ramones dress or pictured beer yeah why did they hate him what happened were they fighting or they just they didn't hate him. They just didn't want to do a prank on him. He was kind of cocky, and they wanted to, you know. But then he, they liked. Uh, so I heard, like Joey was talking in an interview. They were trying to ask him about Sid Vicious, and he kind of changed the subject. But he said he liked him. He was he, he liked him. He was a huge fan. I mean, he came back. I brought him several times back to several London shows to come see the band, talk to the band. He, 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 Sid Vicious was a big BD fan. Yes. Yes. Didi was his guy. That's why yeah. he, he wore his bass the same as Didi. And... Yeah, you know, leather jacket and all that. Same thing, yeah, definitely. They, they, they initially liked the pe pistols, you know. Yeah. Just What's Johnny Rotten you... came up weird, you know. Johnny Rotten uh, what? Johnny Rotten, you know, he was cocky, and so he came backstage, and they wanted to kind of give him a little what, whatever there, you know. Yeah, but there must have been some sort of thing where it's like, I don't like that guy, but then to piss in his fucking drink. Well, they did that impressive. as a goof to a lot of people. You have to understand the, um, some of the mindset there. They've done things to Monty. Not that, but... Well, yeah, they play practical jokes on me all the time. 
which is good because I mean, that's part of being a tour manager, or manager. You take the stuff. If they did it to each other, they get into fight. Why'd you do that to me? Blah, 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 blah. So they, they take stuff. They do little stupid little things like put funny on my briefcase handle or the handle of the van and stuff like that. Take his, take his briefcase and yeah. well, hide his briefcase. Later on, I got smart. I had uh, handcuffs and I cuffed my briefcase to a pipe or something. I think, Marty, I, I think one time you handcuffed your briefcase to a, um, like a coat rack. And we took the coat rack apart and were able to get your briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Did you guys play pranks on other bands? Other than the piss thing, which I guess Not, is a common no. theme here. I don't know. No. They, no. no. Oh, the, the crew had this stupid thing about uh, no Melnicks. Uh, no Melnicks? Yeah. Have you heard about that? The no, no Melnicks thing? Were you involved with that, man? No. I All think right, that came, I think that started with the person after me. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably like an unmentionable roadie. I don't want to mention. Uh, so one one day I'm going to the crew room and they had big, a big sign in the crew room, no Melnicks. You know the circle, no Melnicks. All right, fine. Then all of a sudden we're playing different clubs and I'm looking around in the dressing rooms and on the ceiling they were like no Melnicks on the ceiling and people would come back to me. So we went, we played this club and. We saw this no Melnick solo. What's going on? You know, I said it was a goof. I think in one of the videos, I want to live this life. Um, they actually paid to put up on, you know, Times Square. They had the big uh, sign there in Times Square, a video sign on Times Square. Yeah, sure. They paid to put it up in, in, the, in the video. If you watch, I think uh, I, I want to list this life. They put no Melnick. They paid to put it up in the video. That's awesome. <laughs> they thought it was funny. I don't know. That's all right for me. So, so why write the book? The book's so much work. Why? What was your? Uh... Well, it's not not, not it was a, it was a, a catharsis. I wanted to get everything out. And how long did it book. take you? No, it wasn't that long. About a year. About a year. Well, by the way, Frank Meyer. My oh yeah, I should have mentioned Frank. Terrific I had Frank guy, on here with Ahmed. Wonderful. He's like, uh, yeah, that's right. What a talent. Initially, I said, how it came about is Joey did a solo album on uh, Sanctuary, Sanctuary Music. And at that time, they had a publishing house, you know. So I went in and they said, oh, you, we'll, we'll do a book. I said, I'm not, I'm not a writer, really. I don't write. They said, oh, we'll get you a ghostwriter. So they, they picked up several people out. And Frank was one of the per, uh, people they picked. But he was a oh. great writer, a huge Ramones fan. They did such a good job of getting co-writing. You know? Otherwise, cool. it would have been just my name with the ghostwriter. You know? And he's terrific, terrific guy. He's doing great in L.A. There's so many bands, you know. That Frank Zappa thing is amazing, you know. Yeah, he just right. got engaged too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he's in Culver City now. Yeah, he's doing good. That's cool. And then, uh, what a wonderful world, you know. I uh, I listened to that when I interviewed Andy because Andy had played played or had he did play on that song, and uh, I mean, wow, what a great it's a great cover. version. It's what so a great it's the awesome. Best, one of the best versions. You know, I opened up for Andy once. Oh yeah. <laughs> This is when my book came out, Andy was playing acoustic in this club in Bordentown. The guy that owned City Gardens. Remember, do you ever know City Gardens in Trenton? Remember, do you remember City Gardens in Trenton, Matt? City Gardens? Did you work there with us, Matt? Oh, I think he's frozen. Uh oh. Oh my God. He's frozen up. I thought I was waiting for him to. You could see it's, a big, it was, it's a big club at City, uh, uh, City Gardens. The owner I know it. A, yeah. a place in Bordentown of like a little venue with books and records and, and uh, live shows. And so Andy was at that time uh, doing an acoustic type of thing. And so he said, come on, uh, come and open up for me. You can talk about your book. I had a little PowerPoint. So I opened up, actually opened up for him. And then he came on and played his acoustic cassette. That's good. So you that say, must have been a lot of fun. Andy Sherno. <laughs> he's a great guy. I like the guy. He's terrific. He was a neat guy. You know, he's had an interesting life. So I, I thought I liked him too. Yeah. You know, he's talking about what doing things. Uh, the reason I was with the Ramones for so long was they kept me around, and they, and they had things to do. And when they were off the road, there was rehearsals. I had to get together, videos. The movie was terrific, by the way. Going there for that, you know, I have a cameo in the movie. You know about that, right? Yeah, I saw. And I saw actually you had a, the interview with Poor Man, and they brought you up. That's where I watched it. Remember Poor Man? He's a radio DJ out of LA. Uh, uh. 
And, uh, you know, there's always something going, so they kept me on the payroll and, uh, you know, I eventually got, you know, insurance and all that stuff. So, you know, usually to imagine you do one show, one gig with a group, and then you got to look for another band or something, you know. It's a Luckily, long run, man. 22 years, a heck of a long time to be with the same people. That's because they kept me and they, on off the road, I was working with them off the road too, you know, doing other things. They, they worked hard. I mean, they were, when they were off the road, they rehearsed like a couple of weeks before shows, before, uh, you know, tours and uh, doing, doing videos. It sounds to me like they were treating know. it all. I mean, they were treating it all like a proper business. You know, they were, they were, they were making a career out of it clearly. So uh, I think it's cool because a lot of these bands, they're not able to work out their differences and they split up and then they get That's back the together because they need the money. So. That's the thing. They realized that, it was more important. The music was more important. Putting out an album, that playing live, getting that feedback from the audience was terrific. You know. Yeah. And uh, they didn't want to really uh, break it up. Yeah. And that's that's why when when they got inducted into the Rock and Hall of Fame, you know, said that Joey wasn't there for that. They asked John to go on stage and play with somebody. He said, "I'm not playing with anybody else." So. Green Day actually went up on stage and played the Ramones songs, you know, because usually the band plays songs for the Rock and Roll sure. Hall of Fame. Johnny said no. no. So Green Day went up there and played. And of course, uh, Eddie Vedder inducted them into the Hall of Fame. He had a mohawk, which was very strange. I don't know what he was thinking <laughs> at the time. What new punk bands do you like? Uh, did punk bands? I don't know. I don't listen to punk bands. I like Green Day, you know, the old stuff like that, Offspring. Rancid. I like all those those bad groups. religion. There was actually so one of the interviews I heard Joey said he liked bad religion, and he said those guys sounded okay. Oh yeah, they, they liked a lot of the early group, you know. Yeah. But anyway, well, I appreciate your time. Uh, if you guys haven't read the book yet, on the road with the Ramones, you should absolutely do so. And the uh, bonus edition, there it is. Monty Amazon. did twenty two hundred shows <laughs> with with the Ramones. <laughs> It's a hell of a lot of shows. It's, like, yeah, really I look amazing. back and I, and I list them all in the back of the book. Every single show we ever played. So if you ever wondered, oh, 1986, I saw the Ramones December. And you can look it up and see where exact dates and where we played. That's cool, man. I was lucky enough to do, have that. Because initially, the Johnny wrote down every single show. On a, a little, after sh every show he did, so you know, what did we make, what did we play, and stuff like that. He wrote down, well, down all the shows. And he had the list of them. And I think he, the first this was in the an american band by bestman's book and then he he only went up to a certain date because his book was earlier then i i filled in the rest of the dates at the end in 1996. were there any of the guys in the band that you were closer to like buddies i mean with yeah yeah joey uh initially um my girlfriend's sister was angela joey's girlfriend after linda and stuff like that and uh, I'd hang out with the Joey a lot, uh, and Mickey, and at, at his mother's house. Charlotte, terrific woman. She passed away. It's a shame. So we'd go I'd hang out with Joey. Ah. It's coming on back. There we go. You, you got to invest. You got to do some more of these uh, shows with, uh, with me or whatever. You got to invest in some lighting. Dark, man. All right. You know, one thing. So I, I read online that. So when Joey was born, he had a parasitic twin growing out of his back and they removed it. So did, on his back, did he have this like gnarly, huge scar? Was there he any a scar? He did. Yeah, he had, yeah. He had a scar. You ever see his back from that? Did, did what? I didn't hear. You ever see Joey's back? He had the scar. Yes. Back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He had, yeah. That's, that's probably what drove him a little goofy too, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I just want, do you think that stuck with his psyche like throughout his life of, of going through that or not? Yes. Yes. It definitely, I think it affected him. He, he had a lot of, you know, mental problems and that's why he wrote some of those great songs, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Andy had said, you know, at the end of the day, like these guys were tough to deal with, you know, they were, they were kind of crazy. <laughs> not kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. They all had their own specific uh things he had to deal with so i mean that's one of the jobs of tour manager or road manager even some the roadies too you got to deal with the personalities and and, and and flow with it be very diplomatic about it you know so you fired a bunch of roadies through the 20 years uh, yeah. yourself my, i mean my share my share yeah. <laughs> all right I had, I, had, I, had, I had to tell rich uh, uh, clem that he 
who wasn't uh, in the band. Yeah, do I? I had to tell Clem, Elvis Ramon, that he, he, he wasn't in the band anymore. He played two shows. It wasn't working out. Oh, that's awkward. But lucky for him, uh, lucky for him, he's, you know, Blondie made a whole lot more money with them. But he, you know, he, he was in the band for two shows. You know, people say, no, he wasn't Ramon. Yeah, well, you're on stage. You're, and they took no, no, I don't, I don't think that. What? I don't go that he was a Ramon. Ah, yes, yes. yes. Come on. No. Come on, we took pictures with him and uh, he played through shows. Well, how many song, how many uh, shows did you play on stage, Matt? More than Clem. <laughs> 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 Definitely more than Clem did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I did okay. Clem uh, failed. Well, he, he didn't have enough time to really work it to the group at the time. Yeah. Uh, do, you, so, do you think he would? Do you think he was just filling in? Yeah, I think it, well, he didn't want to be in the band, and that's why we took publicity pictures with him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have taken publicity pictures, you know. But uh, I think it was more filling in thing, because I mean, Blondie wasn't doing anything at the time. Funny thing about it is, Gary Kirkus, the manager at the time, he's, he's uh, uh, had Blondie and the, and the Ramones and other talking heads and stuff. He says, the, uh, you know, you know, Richie quit, quit so abruptly. Um, Gary said, that's easy. No, no problem playing with the Ramones. Do it, go and play. It wasn't that. It's so tight. Boom, 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 boom. Any little tick out of step, it throws everything off, you know? Yeah. And, and unfortunately, Clem didn't have enough time to really rehearse into the whole style. When Marky came in the band, when Tommy left, took about a month or so of Tommy, because Tommy, Tommy developed that style of playing. Tommy was a guitar player, not a drummer. You know, so he developed that style. And when Mark came in, Mark's a terrific drummer, you know, Dust and Richard Hell and all that boy. It's, yeah. It took him a little while practicing to get the step to get the tight set with the Ramones. Yeah. Clem was thrown in so fast because we had all these shows and Richie quit abruptly, you know. Yeah. And Rick Gary says, that's easy. Go play with, you know, it's not, wasn't it? He needed more time. I mean, it was okay, you know. Played two shows, and he realized that they with Blondie and made a hell of a lot more money. Who told you to fire him? The band told him. Then you know, just told him that so he wasn't working out. The band couldn't do it, basically. So they told me to call him up and said, "Look." Oh, he did on the phone. Yeah. And Monty, who called Mark? You did, or the did Ira? How did Mark get involved? You know, that's a good one. Not sure. I don't call Mark. I know I call. I was in touch with CJ, and they should get him into the band. I think that's a common thing with bands too that they don't do it themselves. They have someone else do it. Oh yeah, you know that they don't. Yeah, because they were I, friends. I mean, the early years of CBGBs, the only other groups, the only people in the audience was other bands. Like the Blondie Clem was there and hanging out, and everybody was there was in other bands basically. So they got very friendly with a lot of them. So they didn't know. Um, didn't Sammy Hagar, wasn't he in Hawaii when he found out he was out of Van Halen? <laughs> he had no idea. They, that's the way they do it. They don't have the balls to tell him face to face so they have someone else do it. Yeah, and, um, they felt bad about it. Really wanted to. Uh, what yeah, coincidentally, both Richie and Mark were my neighbors in Brooklyn. And I, Mark, at those days, did not drive because, first of all, he was a raving alcoholic. And so my job was to get Mark to rehearsals. And when they decided they were gonna get rid of him, they started auditioning. Um, I had to go to rehearsal and Mark called me and said, um, oh, well, what are you doing? Are we going to rehearsal? I said, no, there's no rehearsal today. And then he wanted to hang out. And I said, oh, I have something I have to do. And I went into the city and they were auditioning. We did that Billy guy from the Heartbreakers, was it, Monty? Yeah, yeah. And then Larry Tchaikovsky hooked us up with Richie. And Richie came in and got the job. Yeah. yeah. That, that was a, another one of my errors that um, oh, maybe a year or two after I had retired, so to speak, from the Ramones, I had a big black garbage bag full of T-shirts and just tossed them. I had nothing. You know, I, I had a guy on here who's a good friend of mine, he's a sound guy, and he worked for Death Row Records. He did all the stuff for Tupac. 
they threw boxes of lyrics away written by Tupac. He's a literally boxes. I'm like, wow. But even me, you know, and people would say, you know, I don't have anything from when I was a roadie. I'm like, you know, I'm not there to collect shit, man. I was there to work. So there were some people that some people were very smart and got things signed. Uh, I just was, I never saw them going where they are now. Well, guys, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>